Well, thank you for coming today, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about some of the findings of our work um, that has been ongoing for about the last 10 years or so. Um, but first, I have to say on this uh, morning post-Halloween, in case anyone's having any um, concerns, I have tested all the candy. <laughs> And I am here to assure you that the Reese's products and the Hershey's products are of the highest quality. So we call it a candy tax at my house, where the mother gets a percentage of all the candy that the children gather from the neighborhood. So it's all good. So um, with that, I have to say, um, so I've been here at UW-Madison and working in the Wasteman Center for, this is my 12th year. and. Um, it's exciting to me to see all of the, um, you know, sort of the big picture of the Wasteman Center, as Albie just talked about, um, because uh, it is an absolutely amazing place. And I have to say that, um, you know, the work that I've been doing, and many people in the audience are familiar with the work through participation in various other um, things, it's, it's an absolutely amazing place. And I came here to Madison in large part because of the opportunities available at the Wasteman Center. So we're really lucky to have this resource in our community um, that is really striving to make a difference in um, helping individuals with a whole range of disabilities. So. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I've been doing for the last while looking at communication development um, and different kinds of um, profiles of communication abilities in children with cerebral palsy as well as um, some potential directions for change that we need to be thinking about in terms of services. And then Julie Gamrod is going to talk about specific interventions um, and with a particular focus on iPad kinds of interventions um, for individuals with CP as well. So we should dovetail really nicely in terms of um, what we'll be talking about today. And so just to start off, I think everyone in this audience is familiar with what CP is, um, and probably everyone has a vested interest in CP in some way, shape, or form, or you wouldn't be here. But I thought I'd kind of get us all on the same page with what we're talking about. Um, and so in general, this is sort of the official medical definition of what CP is. It is problems with development of movement and posture in some way, shape, or form within the body. It's caused by a disturbance or anomaly in early brain development. So CP is not an acquired disability. It is a developmental condition. Um, and it's not progressive in nature. So people who have CP um, generally are not getting worse. Other things can happen in the course of a life, as they can with anyone, um, that can cause a person to shift or get worse. But in general, by definition, CP is what we call a static um, situation where the original um, lesion to the brain isn't changing over time. Now the big part um, that's of primary interest to me related to CP is that people with CP can have problems with sensation, cognition, communication, perception, behavior, and or seizure disorders. And so there is a whole range of different um, challenges that can co-occur along with the motor problems that are the main characteristic of CP. And so, um, for our purposes, I'm really interested in language, speech, communication, and cognitive development, and how challenges with any one or more of these things can present themselves, and what we can do to help people who have um, co-occurring uh, ranges of problems function optimally and be able to communicate to the best of their ability in their lives. Because to me, the underlying foundation what it is to be human really is um, to be able to express ourselves. That's what makes us different from all other animals, our ability to, um, to communicate. And so the whole idea here is to optimize communication so that we can all um, convey who we are, what we enjoy, and participate in our lives fully. So what we know about CP, generally speaking, is that about half of individuals who have a diagnosis of CP have some type of intellectual disability. This can be a very mild intellectual disability or it can be profound and severe. Um, and so that's about half of our population. About a quarter of the population has some type of learning disability. Um, and so this would not cause the person to have intellectual problems, but maybe just some barriers to, um, to learning. 
uh, that can be overcome through different educational kinds of interventions. Um, and then about a quarter of um, individuals with CP are typically developing in the sense that they don't have any of these intellectual or learning barriers um, that co-occur with the motor problems of CP. Communication has actually been a pretty understudied phenomenon in individuals with CP. There have been massive efforts to characterize motor abilities because that's really the very obvious thing about CP is motor problems in some way, shape, or form. Many of the communication things are hidden. Um, some of them are very obvious for some people, but, um, but for other people it's not super clear um, the extent and specific characteristics of the communication problems that they might experience. And so there's begun to be some research looking at communication challenges and the different patterns of co-occurrence of communication difficulties, but it's relatively new in the field. We know so much and we do such a great job with motor treatments um, and motor interventions, but much less is, is being done with communication. And that's really the focus of, of the work that I've been doing and the work of programs like the Communication Aids and Systems Clinic here at the Waisman Center to support communication for individuals who have these sorts of barriers. So what we know in a very general sense is that if you take all people who have CP, it's likely that about 60% of them will have frank communication problems that are readily observable to the naked eye. Um, but what those specific problems are and how they might co-occur in different patterns has not been studied until the work that we are currently doing here at the Waisman Center. Um, and so we actually think that this 60% figure is a pretty significant underestimate of the range of communication challenges that people with CP um, may face. And I'll talk more specifically about that in a moment. And so what we know about CP is that people who have this diagnosis are very heterogeneous. So that's a huge range of people that can have a huge range of strengths and challenges. Um, and so if you know someone has a diagnosis of CP, you really don't know anything about them. All you know is that there's a motor problem somewhere in their body. You really can't make any other generalizations about their abilities other than some kind of motor challenge. Um, so we call it an umbrella term. It's a pretty nonspecific diagnosis. Um, and in the communication domain, when we're thinking about what can we do to help people become the best communicators that they can be, um, it becomes really challenging to take this whole range of people who vary so significantly in their abilities um, and think about interventions in a systematic way. And so the approach that we've been taking is to try to look at subgroups or patterns or clusters of people based on their communication skills um, and then start to think about how we can take these groups of people who have common characteristics and think about interventions that can um, support them in improving their communication abilities. So, um, so in general, that has been the focus of the work that we're doing. The goal is to identify subgroups or patterns of people who have common features. And if we can do this, then we can start to predict outcomes if we follow people over time. Um, and try to figure out who are the kids that are going to be able to talk, how well will they be able to talk, and the earlier we can figure this out by finding characteristics very early on in let's say an 18 month old or a two year old, if we can make predictions about what they're going to look like when they're 18, um, then we can start thinking about how do we change those outcomes, right? So we know that this pattern looks a certain way or this trajectory of change looks a certain way. What can we do to shift that, to make the change bigger um, and to maximally improve communication abilities um, for different individuals? So that's sort of the whole mission of this work. Um, is to think about therapy approaches that maximize communication abilities for specific profiles of individuals who have cerebral palsy. And of course the ultimate goal is improving quality of life, maximizing quality of life, and social participation. So the aims of the work that I'm going to talk about today um, have been to identify profile groups. So what are the subgroups of people that we might see and the common sorts of communication features that they might share? Um, how do those abilities change over time? And that's really the big thing. How, what do the trajectories of change look like? And what early behaviors might predict later outcomes? 
So that's sort of where we're starting with this work. So as many of you know, um, I have a, a large uh, ongoing longitudinal study of communication development um, in individuals with CP. We started this work in 2005. And we cast a very broad net looking for anybody who was between the ages of two and four in 2005 um, who had a diagnosis of CP or a diagnosis related to CP, like a hemiplegia, prenatal stroke, periventricular leukomalacia, lots of these very um, uh, specific medical diagnoses that lead to motor problems um, that are cerebral palsy. So the kids were under five. It's a huge range of people who really, really vary in their ability profiles. And they had to be able to come to the Wasteman Center. So when they were really little, we saw them twice a year until they were about eight. And now most of the kids are um, seven and eight. Um, and they come once a year to see us at the Wasteman Center. So when they come in, what we look at is we do a clinical, um, a research clinical evaluation of speech production skills, of expressive and receptive language, of a parent-child interaction. We look at the different modes of communication that individuals use. We have parents fill out an exhaustive array of questionnaires because what we know is that what you see in any kid on any given day may or may not actually reflect what they are doing in the rest of their lives. And so parents are awesome informants um, in terms of what else is going on in a child's life and how today might look different or the same um, from every other day that the kid is um, living. We also gather um, individualized education plans. Um, when the kids were little, we got their IFSPs from birth to three. We try to get medical reports and kind of keep tabs on all the other things that are going on. Um, it's a complex population of people who have a lot of interventions, um, a lot of medical procedures. So it's been um, an interesting challenge to try to track all of the things that are going on as our children um, develop over time, but we are trying. So at this point in time, um, we've seen about 135 different kids. And some of these kids have come in 16 and 17 times. Um, and so we have about 1,400 visits across kids. We have tons and tons of information. And these visits are typically two to three hours in length. So um, I took out the slide of the room full of all the DVDs <laughs> of, these, of these children. But we have just a, an exhaustive um, array of information and so we've been spending a lot of time and resources uh, analyzing the information to figure out what it all means and put this picture together um, about growth and change and patterns in children with cerebral palsy so it's been amazing and really really exciting and uh, the families that have participated the commitment of these people to come here um, every year or twice a year has been absolutely unbelievable so we're very grateful to them I'm going to start today talking about um, the first slice that we have looked at, the youngest slice that we have looked at, which is our kids at two years of age. A lot of the kids in our project started when they were a little bit older, so we missed them at two. They didn't come in until they were maybe three or four, but I'm going to show you what we have from the group of kids who were two when they started and what two-year-olds look like. Um, and we were actually pretty surprised with, with these results, and I think there's some uh, really important messages in here. So we asked the question, what kind of profiles might we see um, in two-year-olds who have CP and are children getting speech and language therapy that they need? We know we do a really good job of getting PT, medical interventions, and even OT for these children with CP, but um, are we doing as well with getting speech and language therapy for these children? And so what we found when we took the children that we had at two years of old or two, two years of age was we could basically split them into three profile groups. This is actually a, a very complicated set of statistics and I'm just showing you the end results of this. Um, but what we found was that about 44% of these children were not talking yet at two years of age, okay? 15% um, were doing what they should be doing when they're two. 
and 41% were what we call the emerging talkers. So they're starting to try to approximate some words, maybe put some words together. Um, but this was shocking, actually, to us, because 44% um, of these children not talking was a, a pretty big deal. Kids are supposed to be talking when they are about one. First words begin to emerge in the first year of life. If they aren't talking or saying words by one and a half, it's usually a red flag for some early intervention. And if they're not talking by two, that's a delay. Um, and we need to do something about that. And these are children that have a very significant risk factor going into it. They have a diagnosis. They have a neurological condition. And so, um, so this is a pretty big deal. And um, what we pull from this is that 85% of these kids have delays in speech and language abilities. Um, and so this, is, this means therapy is needed to support communication and language development um, for two-year-olds with CP. When we looked at who's getting therapy then, right, what we see is 85% of our kids have a clinical, measurable speech and language delay, okay? And this 15% that are, we're calling our established talkers who look pretty good, pretty close to what we would expect them to look like at two years of age, we're not worried about them. So we're just gonna cross them out right here. And when we looked at who's getting therapy, what we see is 100% of these kids need speech and language therapy, right? 80% of them were getting therapy, so that was pretty good, but 20% of them aren't, so they actually should be getting speech and language therapy to support development um, of their communication skills at two years of age. All of these children could benefit from augmentative and alternative, alternative communication strategies to support speech and language development. So Julie Gamrod is going to be talking about AAC services and what we can do for children um, in the next presentation. But all of these kids could benefit from some form of external support, not necessarily to replace speech, but to support speech, to support language, for social participation and functional communication. But only 34% of these children were getting any form of augmentative and alternative communication. So massively underserved, right? And let me also say here that using augmentative and alternative communication um, does not mean that we're not thinking about speech. It's just a way to support communication development over time. It may not be a long-term need, but a short-term need at two years of age. Really big deal for expressive communication development. And so we have a problem when we're not serving 100% of these kids, and when we look at what the kids who are actually getting services are getting, they're not getting what they need So um, to really support social development. So we have to do some work there with adv advocacy, educating people about services, educating our graduate students who are going out to become speech and language therapists, um, to make sure that we're moving forward with making sure children are getting the functional communication services that they need. So again, augmentative communication is useful for anybody who can't talk at an age appropriate level, not to replace speech, but to support expressive language as well as receptive language development. And we're not talking about mutually exclusive options. We don't think about assistive technology as a last resort. When all else fails, then we'll go to the iPad or the communication book. No, we use it to support language and speech development from the earliest possible time point so we can maximize outcomes later on um, and really fully participate in life the whole way through. So then we looked at, so the two, the two year old story, right? Interesting, lots of challenges in terms of communication, lots of needs in terms of services that aren't necessarily being met. We then looked ahead at a much bigger group of kids. Many of our kids were not four, they were four when they started the study. So we didn't get them when they were really little. That was a subset of kids that I just talked about. But we have a lot of information on four-year-old children. Um, and so we asked the question, what kind of profile groups do these children fall into, right? And are they getting the speech and language therapy they need when they're four, okay? So what we found, and again, through a whole range of complicated statistics and a measurement of lots of different variables, the long and the short of it is we basically see four different groups that kids can be categorized into. So these group, this 
these groups are, first of all, children who are unable to speak. Now, at four, this is a different story than at two. Um, we're feeling a little more confident, and I'll talk more about the change data that we've seen in a moment, um, that, that many of these kids probably might not be able to speak if they're not starting to do so by four. And we define this group in a really broad way, that they have to have five or fewer understandable words or word approximations. Um, Anybody that was saying more than five words or trying to say more than five words fell into one of these other groups. Okay, so, um, so these are kids that have very severe speech motor impairment or very severe intellectual disability or both. Okay, and they have a whole different set of needs in terms of communication interventions and tools and strategies for promoting, you know, optimal functional communication. The other groups of kids, on the other extreme end, about 24% of the group had normal speaking abilities. So if you just listened to them talk, um, looked at their language, um, they pretty much were indistinguishable from a typically developing child who did not have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, for the most part, at four years of age. And then these two other groups of children, we have a subset of children who have a motor speech disorder. So this is motor problems that affect the speech musculature, similarly to what you might see in the body. Um, and we call that dysarthria. So that is just motor problems affecting um, the tongue, the larynx or the voice box, the respiratory system, um, and the ability to speak, the muscles for speech. Um, and these kids also had problems with language. So they had trouble understanding um, what was going on at an age appropriate level. They still had the ability to understand, of course, but just not at, the, at a level that was consistent with their chronological age. Okay, so they have more complex problems because they have a motor speech problem and they have some language issues as well. The other group of kids, which was about 26%, had that motor speech piece. So again, they have what we're calling dysarthria, it's a technical medical term, motor involvement of the muscles for producing speech, and they had normal language abilities. Okay, So um, they didn't have any challenges at four years of age with understanding what was going on around them. Okay, And so the question is, what kind of therapy are these kids getting? How many of them actually needed therapy? And again, we're going to cross out this group who has normal speaking abilities. We're not worried about them. They aren't needing therapy, speech and language therapy. But 76% of children at four fell into one of these three groups, either being completely unable to speak or having a speech motor disorder either with or without language or cognitive problems that accompany it. Okay? So are these children getting the therapies that they need? And the answer to that is sort of, some of them. So what we um, determine, obviously, is that of the 76% of our group, all of them need speech and language therapy of some type. 90% of them are getting speech and language therapy. So that's pretty good. A little better than what we saw with uh, two-year-olds. 90% of these guys were judged to need some form of augmentative and alternative communication to support their um, language and speech production, but only 50%-ish were receiving any form of AEC. So we're seeing more kids are getting the AEC services that they need when they're four than when they're two, but this is a huge problem. We're missing a whole bunch of children um, in terms of providing the optimal supports to enhance speech and language development and promote functional communication. And so once again, I think the message is that we need to be um, shifting how we train future speech language pathologists, getting the word out about ways that augmentative communication, things like iPads um, and the apps that Julie will be talking about, um, as well as picture symbols, communication books and boards, and other kinds of visual supports um, can really promote functional communication for these individuals. And so what we see in summary um, at this point is about 85% of our kids with CP have language or speech delays at two. But at four, 75% of them do. So there's about 10% that seem to normalize within there. We're going to talk about who those kids are in just a minute. 
Most kids are getting speech and language therapy, but very few are getting the specific type of therapy that would be optimal to enhance their functional communication abilities. And that is a big deal. So, um, so then we said, we went on to sort of take a look at what, what happens between two and four? What are those, what are, and those intermediate age points, what's going on? Who are the kids that normalize? And so what I'll take a look at here is how does speech intelligibility change over time? So this is looking at how understandable are the words that a child is able to produce for those kids who were talking. So now we're gonna leave out to answer this question. Um, the children who were in that um, subset who were unable to speak, okay? We're also gonna look at how language comprehension, the ability to understand um, words and speech around you changes over time, and how your physical abilities, your motor skills in your body might relate to your speech and language skills. And so to start with, what we see here is on the, on the um, x-axis, this is the age points. So children 24 to 29 months, these are all the same children, by the way. So these are repeated measurements on these children. Um, 30 to 35 months, 36 to 41, 42 to 47, and so on. So these are, this is five different visits. And what we looked at here is how many of the children um, were able to repeat words and sentences. So you say to the child, say ball, and the child tries to say ball. They might not actually say ball, they might say ba, they might say ah, but they are able to vocalize and attempt a word approximation following um, the therapist's model. And what we found was that at two years of age, only 20% of our kids were able to do this. Right? So 80% of the kids could not do this uh, repetition task. I brought my typically developing two-year-old in to be a control child um, for the study at this time, and um, she was talking in like three and four word sentences, but she refused to repeat the single words after the therapist, <laughs> much to her mother's dismay, right? <laughs> oh, come on. So there's a behavioral piece here too. There's a compliance thing with kids. So, you know, do I really believe that only 20% of our kids with CP absolutely were capable of doing this task. I'm not so sure, probably more, ki more kids were talking than this. But this is, you know, we, we generally find that um, two is kind of a magical age for being able to do a lot of our testing that we do in speech and language in general. Um, following instructions, being compliant, sitting, doing, you know, doing what you're supposed to do to measure speech production and language comprehension. So as it turns out, my kid, you know, maybe it was my presence, I don't know, but, um, Anyway, so, um, but you can see there's a big jump here. So, and it's not surprising that, um, you know, 40% of our kids could do this at three. Now, we would expect that by three, you know, two and a half-ish, three, uh, a lot more, and typically developing kids can do this 100% by two and a half, three, okay? Um, and so what we see is that our kids are not talking as able to repeat words and sentences um, you know the way that we would like to see them being able to do and again when we think back to those profile groups that we talked about um, a few moments ago not a huge surprise because we see a whole range of um, speech and language challenges uh, with this population and so again 20 percent at 24 months 80 percent of our kids were not talking or at least couldn't do this task um, and by 53 months of age, 64% of kids could repeat words or sentences, but again, 36% were not talking here. Um, and so we have a big group of kids who aren't you know, producing the expressive communication that we um, would like to see. And so again, these are the kids that aren't talking, that desperately need the assistive technologies because they're not able to actively participate in their lives um, if they're not able to you know, communicate expressively with speech and they don't have other tools. Okay, so what happens to changes in speech intelligibility? So um, what, what we have here is basically four groups of children. So in the light blue here are the kids who started talking when they were 24 months of age, right? In the red is kids who started when they were two and a half or 30 months of age. In the dark blue here is kids who started talking at 36 months, and over here is the kids who could only do the task or started talking when they were four, okay? And so this is the length of sentence that they were able to repeat, 
Okay, so a longer sentence basically um, is a seven word utterance and a short sentence is a, you know, obviously a one word utterance. And so what we can see here is the kids who start talking when they're littler have the best outcome in terms of the length of utterance that they can produce. And kids who start talking later don't get as high, at least by four years of age. Now, obviously, we have data on kids going beyond four years of age that we're in the process of analyzing. And so we're looking at and going to be looking at what these lines do, you know, what, where do these kids go who start talking at four? Where do they top out um, in terms of these abilities? And so these are questions that we're answering as we move forward. We look at understandability of children or intelligibility. Again, here are the kids that started talking when they were two. And you can see these guys get up to a little over 60% in terms of their understandability by the time they're four um, or four and a half. Uh, the other children do not get as high, the children who started talking later. And so, you know, this number in general is concerning because by the time you're four, you should be 100% intelligible. So we are clearly talking about children who have speech motor disorders and speech delays here in general in this group. Um, and so that's important from an intervention perspective, but we see the best outcomes for the earliest talkers, right? So what we're concluding from this is that the age at which a child starts talking seems to matter, okay? Um, and children who start talking earlier had better outcomes at four. They had higher intelligibility and they talked in longer utterances. But what we don't know is what happens after four. And are there kids who start talking after four? Um, and what do those trajectories of change look like for those kids in terms of predicting where they're going to end up? And again, the goal of this is to really ultimately look at what can we do to improve these things, to bump everybody up to a higher level so that they're um, talking more and more functionally um, in a more sophisticated way um, within their ability profiles um, earlier. Okay, so now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about what happens to language comprehension or the ability to understand what's going on around you. What we have here is, um, so again, we have age along the bottom. These are repeated measures, the same kids who came in starting at two all the way up to four and a half. And um, the green bars here represent language scores that were within normal limits, okay? The orange is children who were one to three standard deviations below normal limits, so we call them a mild to moderate delay. And then the blue is children who had a severe delay, so they were three standard deviations below what we expect for language comprehension, okay? And so what you can see here um, is that at two years of age, only 25% of our kids had language comprehension skills that were within normal limits. So 75% of these kids had delays at two, um, but at four, only 44% had delays. So again, there's something going on here where kids are making big jumps that are non-linear gains in their acquisition of language and language understanding. Um, and so the question is, who are these kids and what can we, you know, what's going on and what can we do to make that happen for everybody, right? So, um, and so we looked at um, what the change looks like for children based on their scores at two years of age, okay? So these guys in the red are kids who, when they were, or in the blue, sorry, were kids who had language comprehension that tested within normal limits when they were two. And um, what you can see here is the kids who start with strong language when they're two maintain strong language over time. So they stay, 100 is the mean. Um, it's like a, that's a normal language score is 100, 15 is a standard deviation. So in this blue bar uh, here is what we would call the normal range, plus or minus one standard deviation, okay? Um, and so these guys all stay normal if they start normal, right? Um, these guys in the red started out with uh, the mild or, uh, to moderate language delays. So they're down here when they're two, but they make big jumps between the ages of two and three, okay? And so, uh, and then once they get there, they tend to stay there at least until they're four. So they jump up into the average range or the typical range. Um, 
And then these children who start with really significant challenges um, also tend to maintain those significant challenges um, and we don't see big, big changes in their language comprehension skills um, over time. So um, the kids who start with severe delays tend to show little change. And then again, as we said, these moderate kids are the ones that make these big nonlinear gains. Um, and what's going on there exactly, we are not sure. Um, but this is something we're hoping to do more investigation of to figure out what might predict these children, um, these changes. Um, and how can we really optimize what's going on here with intervention and make it happen sooner um, at, to maximally enhance functional communication. The last thing I'm going to talk about is um, how a person's physical abilities relate to um, their language comprehension abilities that we were just talking about. Everyone's probably familiar with the gross motor function classification system here. Um, and this is just a, a five level categorization system to talk about um, functional gross motor skills. So a level one is the mildest um, involvement and five is the most severe involvement. And it sort of has to do with how well a person is able to walk, ambulate, um, get around, uh, use their motor skills functionally. Okay. So we looked at, for our kids who had typical language skills, what did their gross motor skills look like? And what we found is that our typical language kids had gross motor levels one and two, but also gross motor levels four and five. So just because you're really, really physically impaired does not mean that you are going to be really, really language impaired. Um, and so that was actually a pretty big deal. You can't make assumptions about someone based on what their motor skills look like in terms of their cognition and their um, language abilities. So that's really big. Um, for our kids who had mild or moderate language delay, we also saw that same range of gross motor function skills. So we've got mild, moderate, and severe in our kids with the moderate um, language delays. And then in our kids who had very, very severe language delays, what we saw was these kids tended to all have also very severe motor problems. Couple reasons for that. It may be that because of the very severe motor problems in the individual's body, um, they were not able to show us exactly what they know because testing requires you to either talk or use your hands or use a switch or use eye gaze. And these kids are really, really involved from a motor perspective. So, um, so it's hard to know. Or it may be that the more neurologically devastated you are from a motor perspective, you know, the more likely you are to have really significant um, neurological problems that impact cognition and language as well. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done here to try to understand what's going on with these um, children as well. So the take home message here is that there's a wide variety of gross motor function levels among children with typical and mild moderate um, comprehension abilities or delays um, and that the kids with the lowest language abilities also tend to have the most severe um, gross motor involvement. So what have we learned? We've learned a lot and there's so much more to learn. Um, we think that the prevalence of communication problems in CP is underestimated. That 60% number is low. And that if you're talking about two-year-olds, we might be talking about 85% with language delays. Um, by four, still 75%. Um, we don't know about older ages, but that's something that we're investigating. Um, most of our youngest kids with CP here to appear to have significant speech and language um, delays relative to age expectations, so they need to be getting speech and language therapy, not just OT and PT, but speech and language as well to support communication. We see really interesting nonlinear gains in speech and language skills at three. Three seems to be a magic number. Um, maybe there's another magic number later on, and that's something that we're looking at in our longitudinal data of these kids, um, how and at what points we see these big changes. There's not uh, a, an, a strong association between impairments in speech and language uh, abilities and gross motor skills. So don't make generalizations based on what somebody looks like from their motor abilities. Um, most of the kids are getting the speech and language therapy, uh, getting speech and language therapy, but not necessarily the type of therapy that would be most beneficial to their functional communication abilities. So it's a missed opportunity, um, and there are really potentially important detrimental impacts on social participation for these children. 
And so, uh, in the future, we're looking at later age points, looking at growth curves for predicting outcomes, predicting change, looking at different therapies for different profile groups to enhance functional communication, looking at how, moving into a new area, looking at how breathing, speech breathing, um, and therapy to support uh, respiration for speech might impact speech production abilities. Um, also doing some work looking at brain behavior correlates, so how some neuroimaging information from MRIs and CT scans might predict what we're seeing in speech and language abilities, um, and many other things. So that's just the highlight. So a huge thank you to participants and their families who have been so dedicated to this work and have continued to come in year after year. Um, and of course, many, many people in the lab who, with, without whom this work would not be possible. So, and of course, the work is funded by the National Institutes of Health, um, as well as the Wasteman Center Core Grant from the National Institutes of Health. So, thank you very much for your attention.